Good morning. Yeah, I'm on. You hear me? We are continuing our studies in the gospel, or rather in the book of Joshua. There's a lot of gospel in it too. And uh, it's a lengthy portion of scripture, chapters 20 and 21. Chapter 20 is not too long, it's nine verses, but uh, 21 is a lengthy passage, um, 45 verses, and mainly it is the names of cities that were given to the Levites. And so uh, what I'm going to do is read chapter 20, and then I'll read the last uh, three verses of chapter 21. Joshua chapter 20, then the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, designate the cities of refuge of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally without premeditation may flee there and they shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. He shall flee to one of these cities and shall stand at the entrance of the gate of the city and state his case in the hearing of the elders of that city. And they shall take him into the city to them and give him a place so that he may dwell among them. Now if the avenger of blood pursues him, then they shall not deliver the manslayer into his hand because he struck his neighbor without premeditation and did not hate him beforehand. He shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the manslayer shall return to his own city and to his own house, to the city from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, and Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriat Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. Beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, they designated Betzer in the wilderness on the plain from the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth in Gilead from the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. These were the appointed tribes for all the sons of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them that whoever kills any person unintentionally may flee there and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stands before the congregation. Now these are six cities of 48 that were set apart for the Levites and now in verse 21, the heads of the household of the Levites come and ask for the 48 cities that were designated to them, six uh, cities of refuge, and then 42 cities where the Levites would live throughout the land of, of Canaan and on the eastern side in Transjordan. They're designated, and then we read in verse 43 through 45, a kind of summation of this section of Joshua. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And not one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, what a privilege it is to come together as your people on this Sunday morning, this Lord's Day, and we come to fellowship with one another uh, in the Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit, and in Christ, and we can do that and have genuine fellowship in Him. And that fellowship 
is nourished and really takes place through your word, your revelation. And so, Lord, as we look at your word this morning in the book of Joshua, I pray that you would bless us. That you'd build us up in the faith, that you'd help us to understand the meaning of the text and what it meant for Israel, but how it applies to us in a very special way. Help us to see here your sovereignty and your grace, the mercy that you extend to us, the mercy that we receive, though we're not worthy or deserving of it. So Father, be, build us up in the faith in that sense. Give us a sense of who you are and your greatness and your goodness. And Father, we do pray not only for our spiritual needs, but our material needs. We pray for, first of all, the vulnerable among us. We think of uh, Madeline and Audrey and, and Margaret as we have prayed so often for them. Bless them. I pray for uh, the Radford family with the passing of Betty. We um, pray that you would continue to comfort them. And, and now we pray also especially for Al Martin as he is in a very difficult situation. I look to you, Father, we do for mercy and blessing on him. Uh, encourage him and strengthen him and, and give him a sense of your presence. Give all of us that, Father. We, we uh, live in difficult times. I, I pray for the, the, the men and women of our congregation that uh, have jobs that may be in peril or businesses that may face difficulty because of this pandemic. I pray that you'd preserve them and bless them and actually prosper them in this time and bless all of us through it. Bless our health, protect us. But most of all, Father, may we find in this time your faithfulness and your sufficiency for everything. And may we be lights in the midst of a, a, a despairing uh, nation in many ways. May we show strength, the strength of your sovereignty and the strength that we have because of the hope you've given us. And we have great hope. We've studied the inheritance that you gave to Israel, and it's just a picture, and even a faint picture at that, of the great inheritance we have, which is eternal. We thank you for that. It's, it's the hope we have, the hope of eternal life, and we have it by your grace. May that be magnified this morning. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. John Bunyan, who you all know as the writer of the great Christian classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, also wrote an autobiography, probably less known to you than that great classic. It's titled, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Well, if Jacob's third son had written his own biography, that would have been an appropriate title. Levi was a scoundrel, yet he was greatly blessed. Blessed in his life and blessed in his descendants. His tribe was given one of the most privileged positions in the nation, that of priests and teachers and judges, and one of the greatest inheritances in the promised land. That's the subject of our passage, which is Joshua chapters 20 and 21. It concludes the allotment of Israel's inheritance with the cities that were given to the tribe of Levi. The history behind this is the treachery of the two brothers, Simeon and Levi, in Genesis 34, when they slaughtered the men of Shechem in an act of revenge. In Genesis 49, when Jacob blessed his 12 sons, he cursed the anger of these two and said that they would be scattered in the land. And that happened. Simeon's inheritance was in the midst of the tribe of Judah, and eventually it was absorbed into that tribe. And Levi was scattered throughout the nation. But they became God's priests. 
Now, some have thought that that was because Levi, the tribe of Levi, showed faithfulness during the apostasy of the golden calf in Exodus 32. But the family of Aaron was designated as the high priest earlier than that in chapter 28, verses 1 through 4. So their dispersion through the nation was a blessing. And their position as high priests and priests was an act of grace. Back in chapter 13, verse 33 states that Moses didn't give them an inheritance, meaning a, 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 a territorial area of the land. Instead, the Lord, the God of Israel, is their inheritance as He had promised to them. Now, what a privilege that is. It's really a great one. I don't know that there's a greater privilege that was given to anyone than that privilege to be servants of the Lord. That's their inheritance. Special service to the Lord. The tribe would be the nation's spiritual and legal authorities, as Moses and Aaron were, law, the lawgiver and the high priest, both of them Levites. Now, in order to carry out their duties, the Levites were given cities throughout the land, 48 cities. Six of those were cities of refuge. Those cities are listed in chapter 20. The other 42, as well as the six cities of refuge, are listed in chapter 21. Moses gave detailed instruction on the cities of refuge in Numbers chapter 35 and in Deuteronomy 19. And here the Lord instructed Joshua to carry out his instruction and designate the cities. They were established with two people in mind, these cities of refuge, the manslayer and the avenger of blood. Verse 3 of chapter 20, the manslayer who kills any person unintentionally, without premeditation, may flee there, and they shall become your refuge from the avenger of blood. In early Israelite society, the avenger of blood was the person responsible for carrying out justice. He was a relative of the victim, and he was to right wrongs done to the family. In case of murder, uh, his duty was to hunt down the guilty person and kill him. Bring the guilty person to justice, which was not for the family only, but also for the nation. Murder was considered a stain on the land. And, and if the crime went unpunished, then the land, the whole nation, was considered defiled. And so capital punishment was prescribed as the means of removing this stain from the land and from the nation. But that prescription for justice could easily become a a pretext for vengefulness and a vendetta. Blood revenge was um, an ancient custom. In fact, when Cain killed Abel, he feared vengeance. He feared that men would hunt him down and kill him. Lust for vengeance is inherent in man. So to guard against excess and the execution of a person who killed by accident and not premeditation, cities were established to give them sanctuary to the manslayer. So, for example, and this is uh, one of the examples that's taken from the law, if two men were chopping wood and the axe head uh, slipped off the handle and struck the other man and killed him, it was an accident. It was not deserving of capital punishment. But the victim's relative might not see it that way, and in the heat of grief, might carry out revenge. So the manslayer could flee to a designated city and find asylum. It was a provision that was, as one writer stated, without parallel in the ancient world. 
The city served as a preventative measure to blood feuds that could spread and uh, be handed down from generation to generation in which innocent lives would be taken. And they served to reinforce the principle of the sanctity of human life. Executions were to be restricted. Murderers were to be slain, but manslayers were to be spared. The law of Moses was designed to promote life, not to destroy life. The law of Exodus 21, verses 23 through 25, which is repeated in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, which is famous, we're all familiar with it, because it's become no notorious in our day, and notorious because it's been misunderstood. When an injury occurred, the law prescribed eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Now, that sounds harsh to the modern ear, but it wasn't harsh at all. In fact, it was given to establish justice and, and mitigate excesses and injustice. The point is the penalty must fit the crime. So it's an eye for an eye, not a life for an eye, or not a daughter for a tooth. It's really not even clear that this formula was taken or applied literally. Uh, the retribution, for example, or the justice that Moses prescribed and this is an example that he gave, Moses gave, of a slave being uh, wounded, a slave losing his eye. The, pen, the, the, uh, re, the uh, penalty for that, for the person who did it, is the slave is given his freedom, uh, not the offender's eye. So it's not clear that the, this was literally applied. The point of the formula is that... Um, Justice is to be even-handed, which shows us the law of Moses, while it was strict, it was not harsh. It's not about poking out eyes and breaking teeth. The point of the law was justice. It was to curb injustice and to make punishment, as I said, fit the crime. God is righteous. He's holy. He does not and cannot ignore sin. He cannot ignore crime in a nation. But he is also the life giver. And the law shows a concern for life as much as it shows a concern for justice. For example, in Deuteronomy 20, verses 19 and 20, instruction is given on cutting down trees in a time of war. And it prescribes cutting them down. It, it's permitted. If uh, trees can be used in warfare, perhaps in the, the siege of a city or something like that. But it forbids cutting down fruit trees. Now, why is that? Because they nourish. Because fruit trees sustain life. And they are valued. Now, some of you may have seen the movie 1917 about a year or so ago. It's, I think it's based on a true story, but nevertheless, it's a story about uh, two young men in World War I who were sent on a dangerous mission, and very <clears throat> early on, they come to a bombed out Belgian farm. The house is uh, wrecked and ruined, there's no one there, but as they walk through the house, they walk through an orchard. The retreating German army had cut down all of the blossoming cherry trees. There's nothing strategic about it. It was just a, a wanton act of destruction, a vengeful act that uh, wrecked everything that had been done, the effort, the time that had been put into these, uh, this uh, orchard that was intended to give blessing and nourishment. The law of Moses condemned that. The point of that law is to show the value of life. And to show that if God cares about fruit trees, then certainly he cares far more about human life. And that was the reason for these cities of refuge. They protected life. 
The provision for the, the cities are given in verses 4 through 6. The man slayer was to flee to one of them and stand at the entrance of the gate and state his case before the elders. Uh, city gates were invented obviously to control traffic in and out of the city. They were designed for defensive purposes. But also, the gates of the cities of, these, of the ancient world became, or Israel at least, became the place of law courts. Cases were decide, decided at the gate of the city. You look at the end of the book of Ruth in chapter 4. That's where the issue is resolved. And so, the person fleeing there must first state his case. These... Uh, Cities were not set up for murderers, and so the person had to state his case to the elders before he was allowed in. When the avenger arrived, they would not deliver the manslayer into his hand. Instead, verse 6 states, He shall dwell in that city until he stands before the congregation for judgment, until the death of the one who is high priest in those days. Then the manslayer shall return to his own city and to his own house, to the city from which he fled. So he was allowed to live in the city provisionally until the trial took place when he stood before the congregation for judgment. And in Numbers 35, verse 24, it states, The congregation shall judge between the slayer and the blood avenger. And if he has judged to be a manslayer and innocent of murder, uh, then he would be released. But not until, we're told, the, the high priest had died. So the fugitive could stay in the city, uh, it would, but it was a... a it was a kind of exile for such a person, uh, evidently a kind of punishment. His action, uh, after all, did cost a person's life, and so it was not without any kind of penalty. It, may not, it wasn't intentional, but nevertheless, blood was shed, and so there were consequences. He's, he's staying there in a kind of exile, and that would be, I think, punishment for what was possibly carelessness on his part, and in so doing it would serve as a warning to others that they should encourage care and meticulousness in the little things of life and all of the details. But he was to stay there until the high priest had died. Well, there were six of these cities uh, designated as cities of refuge, and they're listed in verses 7 and 8. They were on the west side of the Jordan, and uh, three of them, rather, were on the west side of the Jordan, and three of them were listed uh, on the east side of the Jordan, in Transjordan. The ones on, in Canaan are in verse 7, and then the uh, ones in Transjordan in verse 8. So we read, they set apart Kadesh and Galilee and the hill country of Naphtali and Shechem and the hill country of Ephraim and Kiriat Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. Beyond the Jordan, east of Jericho, they designated Betzer in the wilderness of the plain from the tribe of Reuben and Ramoth and Gilead from the tribe of Gad and Golan and Bashan from the tribe of Manasseh. So if you look at a, a map of these, it goes from the, the top, uh, the, the, the northern part, to the central part of the land, to the very southern part, and the same on the eastern side of the Jordan. These were strategically located cities geographically so that in every area of the land there was a place of refuge to be found. The Refuge these cities offered was often was open not only to the Israelite but also to the the stranger in the land, the alien. It's something we find throughout the the law. God's concern for those that were disadvantaged, and so you have this formula uh, taking care of the widow and the orphan and the alien. 
And so those that were there were to be taken care of. Verse 9 says, These were the appointed cities for all the sons of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns among them, that whoever kills any person unintentionally may flee there. Uh, the care for aliens, I think, is, uh, well, it is, I know, based upon the memory of Israel being an alien in the land of Egypt. And God says that. Take care of the alien because you were an alien in Egypt. And it was a testimony to God's care for all humanity. He was not unfair to the stranger. He was just with all. And that was a great example. It was a, it was a light in the midst of the, heathen, of the heathen nations that surrounded Israel and, and practiced rough justice. They saw something different in this nation that was to be the light to the nations. And so all were offered divine protection until the high priest died. Then they were allowed to go free. It's an interesting provision. Uh, the death of the high priest seems to be an arbitrary reason for people to leave. Why we would think, well, if his case is decided in his favor, this manslayer could, could go. But that was not the case. And it's been described uh, as being arbitrary. I don't think it was, but nevertheless, no explanation is given for that, why the, the freedom came for the individual at that time. Nevertheless, that's what marks the moment of freedom. And all of this showed the value God put on human life. And it's an example of grace. It's interesting and this is where I see the grace involved in this. It's interesting that the tribe whose history was marked by vengeance with a bloodbath of revenge was given the task of managing sanctuaries that would protect from that. The cities given to the tribe of Levi were six cities of refuge and 42 cities of service. Uh, those cities, those 42, as well as the, the six, are listed in chapter 21. The leaders of the tribe step forward to claim them, and that's how chapter 21 begins. Then the heads of the households of the Levites approached Eleazar the priest, and Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the households of the tribes of the sons of Israel, they spoke to them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, saying, The Lord commanded through Moses to give us cities to live in with their pasture lands for our cattle. So the sons of Israel gave the Levites from their inheritance these cities with their pasture lands according to the command of the Lord. There were three branches of the tribe of Levi, according to Levi's sons, Koath, Gershon, and Merari. In verses 4 through 5, we read that the Koathites received 23 cities. They received 13 in the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon. And they received 10 in the tribes of Ephraim, Dan, and the western portion of Manasseh. These were the priests, the sons of Aaron the priest, according to verse 4. And so the priestly cities were mostly within the southern portion of the land, what would become the kingdom of Judah and the location of the temple at Jerusalem. You see in that the providence of God, because at the time that this was designated at the time Joshua executed the uh, instruction of the Lord. Jerusalem was a Jebusite city, and it would be under their control, under Canaanite control for some 400 years. Not until David conquered it would it become the capital of the kingdom. But that was unknown to the Levites. It was unknown to everyone. Uh, they couldn't see that God's purpose in putting so many of their cities in that area was for a purpose. 
He was setting the stage for a shift from Shiloh to Jerusalem long before its time. Now that's how the providence of God works. That's the mystery of providence. We can never accurately interpret the events of our life. Why things are ordered the way they are. Why they take place the way they do. But God is doing a work. And those events, whatever they may be, are preparing us for something. And maybe preparing something very significant in our lives. And that's the wonder of the sovereign grace of God. And I think it's an example of a verse that we looked at last week. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul wrote there that we have an inheritance which fits with the subject that we're looking at and have been for some weeks in this book. We have an inheritance having been predestined, Paul wrote, according to the purpose, according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. His providence ensures that we will have our inheritance. And so we cannot always understand why things happen the way they do, but they happen for a purpose, and God knows. And we will be amazed, I think, at times, and we, we see that as we look back on our lives, but some, the day will come when we're with Him and we will understand how everything fit together. The cities of the Gershonites, the next division within the tribe of Levi, were located in eastern Manasseh, uh, across the Jordan, in Transjordan, and then in the northern part of Canaan, in Issachar, Asher, and Naphtali in the north. Verse 7 gives the location of the cities uh, received, the, the, that the cities of the division of Merari received. They were in Zebulun and among the Transjordan tribes of Reuben and Gad. Then verse 8 gives the summary statement. Now the sons of Israel gave by lot the Levites these cities with their pasture lands as the Lord had commanded through Moses. So the scattering of the Levites among the other tribes was the fulfillment of Jacob's prophecy. But it was a curse turned into a blessing. Their tribal identity was preserved, and they were made ministers of all of the tribes. In his uh, final blessing on the tribes in Deuteronomy 33, verse 10, Moses said of the sons of Levi, they shall teach thine, thine ordinances to Jacob and thy law to Israel. So throughout Israel there were teachers of the Word of God. It was a, a great responsibility, a, a service, and an essential one. They maintained the knowledge of God's Word among the people. Hosea reminds us of the importance of that in a negative statement that is made. Actually, the, the Lord is speaking. But in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, he records God's statement, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The Levites were scattered throughout the land, strategically placed throughout the land to be a spiritual influence that was a preservation against all of the evil influences that still surrounded them. Surrounded them in the Gentile nations, but even with those Canaanites that were scattered through the land that were still there with their influences. These were those that would protect against that. Protect against the evil influences of the world. One writer stated, it has been estimated that no one, no one Israelite, lived more than 10 miles from a city in which Levites had their residence. Well, so every Israelite had the opportunity to be well instructed, had the opportunity for counsel about the, the various problems of life that they would encounter, and had the opportunity to learn about the Lord God and be strengthened in that way. God's provision for the nation in 
the function of the Levites and their geographical distribution reminds us of the importance of the instruction of the Word of God. As noticed in Warren's prayer, he gave a great deal of emphasis to learning and studying the Word of God throughout the week and the importance of it. And we find that all through the Word of God. Old and New Testament alike. It is a lamp to the feet, the psalmist said. A lamp to our feet. It guides us through the dark days of life. It guides us through the difficulties of this world. The Word of God is a lamp to our feet and it gives wisdom and a sound mind, the Apostle Paul wrote. Without it, we drift. Spiritually, we drift from the faith and we succumb to the temptations that surround us. Verses 9 through 42 list the cities and locations that were given to the tribe of Levi. Some, some of them are noteworthy. For example, in verse 11, the city of Hebron is listed. Thus they gave them Kiriat Arba, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah with its surrounding pasture lands. Now, that's noteworthy because Hebron was the city given to Caleb, and which he conquered. And yet he gave it to the Levites for their use. And as verse 12 says, explains Caleb and his family kept the surrounding pasture lands. They cultivated that. They took care of all of that. But the city itself was given to the Levites without protest from this faithful man, Caleb. And it's an example of his faith, I think, and an example of the way a, a, a person of faith is to live. A person of faith holds the things of this world loosely. He or she doesn't seek to hold on to all of his possessions for personal pleasure, but uses them for the Lord's work and understands the providence of God when God has another use for them. Well, Caleb knew that all that he had, all that he possessed, was given to him by the Lord God. It was a, a gift of his grace. And uh, Caleb was glad to give it back. In fact, I think he was probably glad to have Levites there near him to give instruction in the law. In, in verse 17 and verse 18, the cities of Benjamin, Gibeon, and Anatoth are listed. Anatoth is significant because that's the home of the prophet Jeremiah. And so he would leave from that town and just go up to Jerusalem not far away and have his ministry. Gibeon is significant because it was the city of the Gibeonites, who you remember from chapter 6 had deceived Joshua into making a covenant with them. And so a city of lies became a center of truth. That's the grace of God. In verse 21, one of the, the cities in the territory of Ephraim that is listed is particularly interesting and significant in this context. It's given as a city of refuge, and that is Shechem. Well, that's significant because that's the site of Levi and Simeon's treachery. But the Lord chose the place of the blood revenge as the place where refuge would be given against the avenger of blood. The one city you might expect would be withheld from the Levites is Shechem. But he gave them the place of their family's shame in order that they might protect men from excessive vengeance. Much like the Lord took Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, the destroyer of the people of God, to be the builder of the church, the man of the law to be the apostle of grace. That's the grace of God. Now at the end of the chapter, the whole section of the book regarding the division of the land is summarized in verses 43 through 45. These uh, verses have been called one of the key sections to the entire book 
because uh, here the theme of God's faithfulness is summarized. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it, and they lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, according to all that he had sworn to their fathers. And no one of all the enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hand. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. God is faithful. That's the testimony. He does not promise any inheritance that he does not give. He does not make a promise that he will not keep. He is faithful always. He performed every part of his promise. Now, this didn't mean that every part of the land was conquered. It wasn't. Canaanites continued to live there. Um, Joshua has pointed that out to the people, to the Ephraimites and to others, and go and conquer the land if you need more, more space. And they did. And so more remained to be conquered, even as this statement was made. But the Lord had told Israel back through Moses in, in Deuteronomy 7, verse 22, before the conquest even began, that, that, they would be, that they would conquer it gradually. And the people would have uh, setbacks for the rest of their history. They would fail, and they did fail. But their unfaithfulness would not annul God's faithfulness. As Paul put it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And the book of Joshua affirms that. No one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. And His promises to us will come to pass as well. But the lessons here are even more specific than those that are given to Israel. The refuge given in those cities of refuge was a blessing, but the refuge that we find in Christ is infinitely greater. Those cities gave no mercy to the murderer. In fact, while the law of Moses was perfect as law and distributed justice fairly and evenly, it was all about justice. It's not about mercy. It made no provision for the murderer. There was no provision in the law uh, of mercy and forgiveness for many, many sins. In fact, what are called sins of a high hand had no sacrifice for them. And those sins are really the sins that are most prevalent, most common. Sins that are, are, are done defiantly, that are done deliberately. There was no sacrifice for such a sin. There was sacrifice only for sins of ignorance and weakness. Willful, presumptuous sinners had no refuge. They were outside the camp. Levi could not have found refuge in those cities of refuge that his children possessed and where they judged. But still, the city of refuge gives us a, a picture of the grace that would come, the, the eternal refuge for sinners. The picture is given in the law that when the, the high priest died, the manslayer was freed. Now, as I said, there's no reason stated for that provision. And there has been speculation. Why did the manslayer have to wait until the high priest died? Well, perhaps all of that is by design to be a type of Christ, to be a type of the one who would come, the great high priest, who, when he died, set the prisoners free. So these cities of mercy for the manslayer were a picture of our eternal refuge in Christ and the mercy that we find in him. Hebrews 
Chapter 6 may be based, or the exhortation may draw upon that, because there the author uh, speaks of believers in verses 17 and 18 as the heirs of the promise, and says of them, we who have taken refuge. So the sinner, the heir, the believer who is saved is one who has taken refuge. Christ is the refuge for sinners to whom we may flee for safety from the wrath to come, from the justice of God that we all richly deserve. We have it from Him because He suffered that justice in our place. All who believe in Him are in Him and can never be removed from Him. We have forgiveness. We have shelter in Him and are forever secure in Him and safe. At the beginning of the lesson, I mentioned John Bunyan. I mentioned his autobiography, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, and said that would be an appropriate title for Levi's life. In fact, it would be a good title for the lives of each one of us. God only saves sinners. And the more clearly we see ourselves, the more clearly we see the greatness of our own sin and guilt. John Newton did. He was an amazing work of grace. Saved, as you know, while a slave trader, while engaged in that heinous practice. And he went on to be a great and selfless servant of the Lord and servant of those slaves because he was an advocate for their manumission, their freedom. Um, we see very clearly in his life the greatness of sin. And that's why he became the author of one of our favorite hymns, Amazing Grace. Well, good quotes are quoted often, and I've given this quote often. But when Newton was old, when he was uh, at the end of his ministry and really at the end of his life, he said, my memory is nearly gone, but I, rem I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. He died not long after that. Christ is a great Savior. Is He your Savior? Is Christ your refuge? We will all die. We will all stand before God the Judge. Will you stand before Him in Christ, forgiven and clothed in His righteousness, or stand in your own sin? The Lord loves life, not death. He gives eternal life to all who come to Christ. If you have not done that, come to Him. Flee to Christ. Trust in Him. He receives all who do. May God bless us with that. Give us encouragement in the faith and encourage you, if you've not come to Him, to come to Him. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we thank You for the pictures You give us of Your grace all through Your Word. And here we find it in these six cities of refuge. Um, they picture more than just Your justice in that dispensation of the Old Testament. That reminder of who You are. That while You are, you are just, You also have made provision for the sinner and that provision ultimately is in Christ. We thank You for that. Thank You for Him. Thank You for sending Him. And thank You, Lord Jesus, for coming. So Father, bless us as we consider these things. Remind us as we are reminded from this passage of the importance of Your Word and how we need to be men and women, young and old alike, who study the Scriptures and know the Scriptures and understand who You are from Your Word. And in so doing, we will understand your sovereign grace and how it blesses us richly. We are debtors to mercy alone. So we give you thanks for that. And Lord, we're reminded of that by the elements that are before us. And soon we will take them as we observe the Lord's Supper. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for that. And um, 
May we take it properly and may it have its proper sanctifying effect upon us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to read from Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. It would be a good exercise for every believer to sit down at least once and, and read through one gospel in one sitting. If you ever have occasion to do that, you'll undoubtedly feel the drama mounting at uh, the end of Jesus' three-year ministry as he makes his way to Jerusalem for the final time. Uh, the religious leaders in Jerusalem had it out for Jesus. Nevertheless, as the gospel writers tell us, he set his face like flint to go there. His journey there was purposeful, uh, and he would not be deterred. But for me, one of the more quizzical circumstances the Gospels describe is how his disciples were completely unable to comprehend the Lord's plain and repeated advisements to them of what he knew faced him there. And here is one of them beginning in verse 17 of Matthew chapter 20 as Jesus was about to go up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside by themselves. And on the way, he said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. Now that was the purpose for which Jesus Christ made his way up to Jerusalem. He was going there voluntarily to be delivered over and condemned to death and to suffer and die on a cross so that in doing so, he might take upon himself the punishment uh, for the sins of those who in another place he called his sheep take upon their sin upon himself. The Lord told them so in advance, more than once. Uh, Luke uh, gives us four separate occasions when Jesus uh, gave them this warning. But they could not comprehend it. It was incomprehensible to them that the Messiah would have to suffer in that way. A few chapters before this Matthew 20 passage in Matthew chapter 16, you remember the Lord told them the same thing. And Peter uh, rebuked him. Uh, God forbid it, Lord. And Jesus responded with those uh, remarkable words, get behind me, Satan. The devil himself would have deterred Jesus from his destination if he could have. Well, here in the verses that I've just read, uh, two of his disciples were so unaffected by Jesus' words, they immediately sought to arrange their own prominence in his coming kingdom, one on the right, one on the left, they said. The disciples of Jesus, who spent the better part of three years at his side, entirely missed his mission until he had accomplished it and God raised him from the dead. But now today, uh, we have the opportunity to remember Christ's suffering and death on our behalf. And those who partake of the bread and the wine, in doing so, speak forth our own declaration that we do comprehend what our Lord has done for us. Take, eat, the Lord said. Uh, drink from it, all of you, he said. And as we do take and eat of the bread and take and drink of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And surely that is a part of what the apostle meant when he instructed us to observe this Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, entering into it with an awareness of why we are doing it uh, with grateful hearts. And above all, now with an attitude of reverence for the love of God 
in Christ in the light of the sacrifice he made on the cross. The bread represents his body given for us. Let's give thanks for the bread. Father, we do thank you now for the opportunity, uh, each one of us individually, but as the body of Christ, to take of this bread and in so doing to remember uh, our salvation, the love of God for us, that you uh, did not spare your own son, but delivered him over for us all. And so, Father, we pray your grace that we might, uh, as we think about these things, uh, with grateful hearts, uh, remember them and determine to follow you more faithfully in the days ahead. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that's sovereign grace. When we didn't love God, He loved us. And the great demonstration of that is that He sent His Son to be the propitiation for us. A propitiation is a sacrifice that satisfies God's justice. And in satisfying His justice, turns away His wrath. And He has done that for every believer. He did that for us at the cross through the gift of His Son. At Calvary, Christ gained forgiveness for us, His people by suffering God's wrath in our place. And that's what we remember with this cup. So let's give thanks for it. Father, we do thank You for the cup that reminds us of the great sacrifice Your Son made, the sacrifice You sent Him to make for us, and that He obediently did willingly, and in fact gladly, for the, the glory and the blessing that He knew would be obtained by it, and that is the salvation of His people. So we thank You for that. Thank You for what this cup represents, and pray that You would bless us as we consider it Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I hope the Lord gives you a good week. Let's close with the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Until next week, keep looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith.